No, 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 no. Yo. Yes! Woo! Yes! 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 you ask that? You can't tell me again? <laughs> you don't love me? Well, do you, do you know the answer? Yes, I know not? the answer. You love me. <laughs> so so, so tell me again. Want some grapes? Yeah. 
<laughs> Do you want me to feed it to you? Yeah, I thought you were going to. Okay. Okay, come on, stop. Mm. They're warm. I mean, it's sunny. <laughs> They're not good. I gotta try the banana. <laughs> you gotta pack an ice pack next time. I don't have any ice. <laughs> <laughs> So before we go, I just, I, I mean, I, not, we don't have to go, but I mean, if you mm -hmm. feel like going, but I did, I did want to ask you if, yeah. if you would marry me. I know, it's, take your time. Is that a, are you, hey.
This whisk saved my life? We'll need to start over. Is this thing on? <laughs> From the top? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what she says. 15 miles offshore. No, no, just the apron. Yes, and the items. She's a uh, character. on the ship? Ship cook. What would you say your duties look like on a daily basis? Cooking for ship crew. Did you want to hear the menu? Let's focus on the day that brought you here. Well, it was Wednesday, so... Eggs, choice of meat, toast for breakfast, tuna salad sandwiches for lunch, and chili with a chunk of hoagie bread for dinner. You didn't want to hear the menu? I was cooking. Um, like every day I was cooking, I would serve, I cleaned up after myself, the sun would set, I started cutting peaches for ice cream. You had not mentioned dessert. I thought you didn't want to hear the menu. I was cutting peaches for dessert when I felt it. It. Can you describe what you felt? That's what I was getting to. Yes, of course. Um. I felt a small rumble under my feet. Not, not big. Um, big ship rocks, crashing waves, you hear that stuff all the time. This one was different. Not big, but, but different. Working on a ship, there's not a lot of places to go. Uh, not a lot of new. It's a new feeling you notice. This rumble is what alerted you that there might be a problem. That's right. And this is what brought you to the deck. Do you want to tell the story? Uh, first a, a rumble, a small one, and then water. You, you hear water all the time when you're out at sea. Water takes the place of silence, but uh, this was different, uh, closer. Um, imagine hearing water every day like this. Whoosh. And then suddenly, whoosh. It's closer, too close. That's what brought me to the deck. Everything is sideways, I mean, no balance, legs fumbling over legs, arms tumbling into cold water, and then boom. Boom. A sound, uh, a big sound, bigger than a sound, an, an explosion, uh, the kind that you feel from your head to your toes. Um, and then, and then, and then uh, I, like, <laughs> I find it very funny. I think it was the oven. I never liked that thing. After you... This? Yes. I was alone in the sea. There was no sign of the boat. I, I mean, I couldn't tell if I was upside down or inside out, if I had limbs or not. But I did have this. Whisk, mousetrap, captain's hat. This is all you had? This is all I needed. You are confused. I am. Oh, <laughs> of course. Why would a cook wear a captain's hat? I just like hats. 
you are not confused anymore? I just, uh... That's I... okay. Collect yourself. Oh, that that's quite all right. I just, uh... Well, you're sitting here. I am. <laughs> and you got here from the, uh... With, with with no raft. I had all no I needed. No food. No. Oh. Perhaps you have little imagination. Can I paint you a picture? Do you have a pad and pen? If you limit what you think one can do, You'll never do anything else. If you expect a whisk to be nothing more than a whisk, then don't expect anything other than whisking. Write that down. This whisk makes a fantastic fish trap. Never one for sushi, but desperate times. Do you know the rest? I do. A whisk is fantastic for catching fish, but it's not good at getting you anywhere. I was stuck in the middle of the ocean. Right, exactly. So mouse trap. So I need... Snap, snap, snap. It's just for catching mice, no? Just a killing machine? That's what I know it's used to be. Wrong! Yes. Well, yes. Mice try to get into my kitchen all the time. Therefore, lots of mouse traps. Mice traps. Hmm? Mice traps? Hmm. Do you hear that sound? I hear you snapping a mouse trap. Of course you do. That's not what the dolphins hear. They speak in sound waves. Do you know Morse code? Vaguely. Hmm. SOS. The dolphins apparently do too. That's all I know in Morse, and the first pot of dolphins that came upon me primarily spoke Bulgarian. I'm sorry. They s they spoke. They spoke. The dolphins spoke Bulgarian? I don't speak Bulgarian. We did. I... That's all right. Uh, collect yourself. I, uh, <clears throat> you know what? Continue, please. The second pot of dolphins spoke Spanish, so I was in luck, and that's it. I don't understand. <laughs> you brought me here. It's not exactly an ideal location, but beggars shouldn't be choosers. <gasps> Write that down. The Spanish dolphins brought you here? This port was on their way home. I had to swim to the shore, but I was grateful for the ride. And then you and your people found me and brought me here. That's it. Are we done here? Well, I, I, I you didn't even, what was the hat for? I just look fabulous in it. And it protected me from the midday sun. Are we done here? Sure. We, we're not holding you. We uh, just wanted to get your testimony on record. I'll even give you my autograph. Polished. Sharp. Distinguished. Experienced. Smart. Uh, I guess. Twenty-five to 
No, no, I'd say somewhere between 30 and 40. Regular glasses, probably like 10. Tell me four pairs of glasses in my life. Uh, so I started wearing glasses in second grade. I couldn't see the chalkboard. The teacher kept asking why I was making faces during class. And she's like, I think you might need glasses. And I took that personally. Um, I thought, no, I'm just, I just like making faces. I remember doing one, doing an eye test at school, but I would just like squint and like get through it and pass. I think I was 14 or 15 when I first got glasses. I felt like they were made me look so cool, so I lied about having bad vision. And my mother brought me to the eye doctor, and the doctor basically brought us into his office and said, there's just no scientific way that he could possibly have the prescription that he just told me that he has. So either there's something horribly wrong that I've never heard about, or he's lying. kind of looks like when I take them off and put them on, the fit, everything lifts. I remember the first time I ever put glasses on, I was like, oh, <laughs> like people don't all look like they're in a painting. I need my glasses to like enjoy nature. I need them to go hiking, to see birds. I couldn't see something that was far away from me. I could only see close. You can't see far away, I'm nearsighted. Okay, yeah, I'm nearsighted, I can't see far away, got it. <laughs> so, you might think these are just regular glasses, but they're a special type called transitions. So in the sun, they get really dark like sunglasses. And when there's no sun, they just look like this. Transitions are a very cool type, and the principal of my school even have them. My parents both wear glasses, my brother. Mom wears glasses, my oldest sister wears glasses, my other sister wears glasses. I have two older brothers who have perfect vision and perfect hair. Gorgeous is with or without the glasses. When they are the smaller, uh, soft rectangular version that I prefer, that then I feel like allows my face to have more expressions. Big round glasses just take up so much more space. It pulls focus, really. My round glasses pull focus from my face and I'm not about to be upstaged by plastic and whatever else goes into glasses. I'm just not gonna do that. I think they can be fun because you can pick different ones. I mostly switch between two different pairs. The pale pink clear one. And I like the tortoise shell because it looks sophisticated. You know, they're neutral. They go with everything. <laughs> I really like sunglasses too. My wife, when we first started dating, I wore, I wore metallic glasses that were too small for my head. And so our first out of town trip together, she made me go into a store and try on glasses. This just style of frame is like black plastic, wider for my face, and I've, I really like them. And then I've always had that, that, sort of, that sort of style frame since then. I used to have this really wacky and terrible pair of like red asymmetrical glasses. They were red and pink. And so I think one had like the pink part kind of went up. Um, they were real arty. They were expensive and someone else bought them for me. I broke them, I don't remember how, but like kept them together taped for like a good year and a half because as I said, they were expensive. <laughs> I 
I drove from Denver by myself from Denver to San Francisco. So I stopped off at some little campsite and I busted out my tent and the next morning washed my face in the river and I got in the car and I drove to California. I left them on a rock in Nevada and I got to my brother's house, no glasses. And my mind just immediately shot back across the landscape right to that rock. And I was like, they're sitting on that rock, right? That's where they are. I remember that's exactly where they are right now. And they're probably still there, who knows? To shoes, known to set my rhythm, known to give me the blues. I feel sky high at times when in them. Seeking comfort, I find them, but I'm who they choose. They've taken me to school, been so fly, they made me act a fool. Protected me on rough terrain, reminded me I'm indeed my mother's daughter. Shielded me from rain and let me wade in the water. They've measured my steps up to the altar, the only place my burdens could rest. And though at times I stumble or falter, one foot forward and assured I give my best. The soul is a soul that keeps me grounded, made from leather, built to weather any storm. I've learned to exist in those in whatever state found in, to walk aware enough to keep my heart warm. It matters not whether or not they are gold, green, or pink. So long as they've been laced with love, so long as they make me think of all the hands and time it took to create a masterpiece and give me a new look at life, at journeys, at transition, at strife. The goal is to collect as many pairs as I can, to walk humbly within the souls of my fellow man who made these shoes by drawing patterns, making shapes, casting molds, sowing seeds, growing possibilities, believing, seeing, I understand my plight and will proceed toward evolving, respecting every single walk of life. Here's an ode to pockets and all the things they fit, like sanitizer, secret notes, and balm for broken lips. Here's to buried treasure in every pair of pants, the jingling of change as old legs learn to dance. A pocket's possibility, a companion for the road, and yet we never give it due for lightening our load. A pocket is a chance to turn our cold hands warm. A pocket is protection from an unexpected storm. A pocket's extra space without the extra cost. A pocket's the first place we look for something we have lost. 
My pockets used to carry my wallet, phone, and keys. Now I pocket anything that brings a sense of ease. Canisters of film that have never kissed the light. Airplanes made of paper, folded into flight. Notebooks bound in leather, leaking ink from page to page, bursting with the stories that will never meet a stage. My pockets are the part of me you won't find on the nose. The part of me just for me, just beneath the clothes. To the camera lens. You shapeshifter of time and place. What is it like to be both antiquated and modern? You sit on my bookcase, stare at me from my laptop, reach for me from my pocket. What is it like to defy the possibilities of 10 decades ago, 10 years ago? You allow us to pause and play, to make a moment last a lifetime, crafted in the image of my eye, at your center, an iris, a pupil. I am still learning that I too am a collector of light. Like me, life passes through you with a shudder, click, blur. As a child, I used to love viewing the world through this silent spectator. With a small adjustment, I am granted a new perspective. Hard edges become soft. I watch as the lens struggles to find balance, as we struggle to find each other. Zoom in. You invite us to see ourselves, to notice things not seen before. By holding us in all our impossible joys and sorrows, you make memorial of our shared humanity. Widen our scopes, allow the world to witness, beg us to not look away because what is documented cannot be erased. You pull our focus, drag the brutality of America out of the dark room and into the light. From Bloody Sunday to Black Lives Matter, the hands that cradle you can inspire mass media to mass movement because when we see ourselves for who we really are, that is when we heal, zoom out. You curate our lives from the sunset to the raised fist to the child who enters the frame who is always shushed away to the smiles that emerge to everything we have yet to learn. You ask us to recount, to remember, to hold our history with both our hands so we can develop beauty from our pain, hope in our shadows. And when I lose my way, you remind me with a small adjustment, I too can gain greater clarity. Shutter, click, blur, one moment. And isn't that exactly what we are? A chance to focus our light, change our perspective, and defy the possibilities of 10 decades ago. To picture frames. I decided that my heart would be the first hole in an empty wall of my home and that I would build from there. I was afraid to commit to the holes in my wall. What if the nail was too high or low, leaving a permanent scar? My heart, with its red grooves and turquoise undulations, had to be centered. I had framed it after my 36th radiation in a black frame I found in the Salvation Army. During the long days of chemotherapy, the artist Nina Poklipkowitz had mailed me a watercolor she made during her 75th meditation in quarantine titled Alex's Heart. In the years prior, we were nomadic, nesting in homes in West Hollywood and Santa Monica, where I'd hoped to find a wall to hang the art I made by coloring the languid spaces between the branches of the queen-like trees I had shot in Central Park, 
and on dark night walks behind the Museum of Natural History with its skeletons of animals no longer with us. Eventually we found an apartment jutting from a hill that gazed upon the ocean. It hung like a cloud with a southern wall, the expanse of the sky. I knew I had found my wall. The eggshell emptiness of it invited trees and other possibilities. As I planned where I might desecrate the wall with nails, I was diagnosed. Seven centimeters of a mass in my left breast, the rest was in my lymph nodes, twelve to be exact, the same number as the apostles. The wall waited patiently, like an ancient being mulling its existence during my mastectomy, sixteen rounds of chemicals, then radiations, making my skin thin like a petal. During that time, I passed the wall with its monastic emptiness, a silent hum, a gravity waiting. As my hair grew in, I found more frames. I placed my pieces in them, my protest art and skeletons, and also the photo of an old woman I once shot while she studied a sculpture of a young woman as if she had traveled through time to visit her younger, petrified self. More holes dotted the wall like a galaxy. I feared what my landlady might say, but then told myself I could spackle them one day, returning the sky to itself. Now I have my wall, as I dreamt it, built from Alex's heart. I hold it in, planning what space I might fill next. With what? And I know, as I see it in my mind, that I still have a future.
Thank you.